Is this too bright? Okay, it's Christmas, so we're gonna have to deal with those lights. Let's let's talk about why you're codependent and what you need to do about it. I'm sure at this stage, most of you have come across with the term codependency, but just to sort of bring it home for everybody, codependency is a relational adaptation, is a way of being, is, is like, you know, when you're trying to play a video game or you're deciding what clothes you're going to wear, codependency is that choice that you made, the unconscious choice on how to be human. And the primary goal or the biggest drive behind deciding what type of human we're going to be is based off of our observations, what kind of human do others seem to be wanting us to be so that they will accept us and want us and love us? Because that is our only, um, our only goal in life is to especially upon entering life, is to belong, right? So we want to belong, we want to be liked, we want to be loved, because we want to be safe. I mean, if you think about how we've evolved as species, is because we were part of a community altogether. I'm seeing some random stuff show up on my camera, but I'm just going to do this anyway and see what happens. Right, so being codependent is an unconscious decision that you took so that you would adapt in environments that otherwise could not see you. So it was a mechanism to cope with um, not being perceived, right? So feeling unworthy, feeling invisible. And the way you're using codependency as a way to cope, um, because it creates this false self that will pursue worth and visibility for you, right? This, it's this perfect self that you're just sort of creating that is oriented towards others. It's exclusively oriented and fixated towards others, at least externally. But the inner drive is to gain a sense of worth, right? To be recognized and to be loved. So you want that fake self to pursue this visibility for you, right? The invisible you. And this self will just become whoever they think they need to become in order to achieve that. And so no wonder if you're codependent, you have no boundaries, you have no needs, because you don't exactly have a self, right? You've not perceived the self that you are. You're just focused externally to see what kind of self you need to create. Therefore, you don't know your needs. You don't know what you prefer. You don't, you just know all of that and more about others as a way to get others to then see you and hopefully do the same for you. We could see codependency as it's a bit of a stunted growth as to how we're going to meet our own needs. We always think it's through others, right? Others have to do it for us because we think we have to do it for them. So we're pretty confused as to how to do that directly with ourselves because it doesn't matter if it comes from ourselves. We don't value ourselves enough or identify ourselves as being somebody who can actually provide for us. It has to come from somebody else. So beyond being a rela relational adaptation, codependency became who you are, right? Like this is now who you are. Uh, and it happened before you even realized who you were outside of codependency. So you couldn't meet yourself as somebody who was themselves, right? You never met your authentic self. And you just met the one that fixes everybody, saves everybody, is just is someone for everybody in the hopes that everybody or anybody will be something for them. The adaptation of codependency is pretty tricky. I work with a lot of people who are codependent and I, I guess I should say we're codependent because through the work that we're doing, you cannot continue being the same way. Like once you see what this is, once you comprehend the whys of doing it, and once you understand how all of this is playing out, it is very difficult to continue to be this way. It is very difficult to continue to go down the same path of codependency and you will sort of be forced to change your ways because it no longer works, right? When we reveal unconscious mechanisms, usually we really shift massively and cannot go back. So 
The reason Codependency, though, is tricky is because it has a lot of victim rap around it, right? We're usually the ones that are being used. People don't appreciate us. They don't love us, right? So it has this kind of like martyrdom, right? We're martyrs and everybody, we're trying to take care of everybody. Nobody appreciates us and we do for, you know, like this selflessness. Because of course, you know, when you are boundaryless and you just serve others, you're going to be, you're going to end up being used uh, by people. And those people are going to be manipulative people. But at the same time, you're also manipulating the situation. Even if unconsciously, this is not authentic, right? This is not real. And we don't really like talking about codependency as something that is bad instead of like, oh, poor me kind of thing. Um, because it sounds like you're being blamed. And codependents have a very sensitive spot about being blamed. You always want to be the good one in the equation, never wanting to look bad because that feels unbearably horrible for you. But, but somewhere in that talking about it for what it really is, it can give you the opportunity to become responsible, to take accountability, to recognize your ways. Outside of this being a, a blame game, it could just be a recognition of how we've been behaving and how we're going to stop behaving this way and move towards different things. So taking responsibility isn't the same as everything is your fault. And I know you have this sensitivity, but it doesn't have to be this way. So we can look at it from a broader picture of it's not, I'm not all bad or all good, but there's things like, like this and things like that, right? We can hold a duality of who we are rather than this black and white, all good or all bad. Codependency is a manipulation. It's a way of being outside of our authentic expression. And we need to call it a manipulation, even if it's unconsciously decided, because we're not being genuine or authentic with others. Anything we do in order to pursue our needs, right, and to, to fulfill our needs, that is outside of our authentic expression, is by default a manipulation. So we do this because we don't think our needs would have been met if we just we're ourselves like we don't have experience of just showing up in the world and and they're all being like yeah well, what can i do for you there's so many things that we have to do first right there's so many prerequisites for us to be met if we even found which ones right so we never really got the experience of being met and seen and valued and recognized unless we we're being someone so we became essentially whoever our environment wanted us to become and we became somebody everybody could rely on, somebody who has no needs, somebody who isn't a burden, right? A child who raises themselves, raises their parents, their mothers, their siblings, everybody just depends on you. And all of that is driven by a need, by an unmet need, right? An unmet need to be seen, to be worthy, to be perceived as worthy so that you know that you're worthy. Because that's the battle here, right? You don't think you're worthy and you're trying to do enough so that finally you feel like you are worthy. But then, then the next thing that's gonna happen, you're gonna feel unworthy again, and you're gonna feel unworthy, like it's never enough, right? As an adaptation to unresponsive environments, it makes sense that you would decide to go at any length in order to get a response, this feedback of worthiness, of existence even, and that you matter. But it's a masking, right? It's You're masking your authentic, uh, self and self-expression to become somebody people give connection and love to but you know that that someone is a new right like you can perceive it you really missed out on the opportunity to find out who you are and all you know is to be someone who you know is a shadow is overextending themselves doesn't have boundaries and another interesting thing that you do is you completely take on the responsibility of everybody else. Like you you think you're in charge of everybody else's life, everybody else's happiness, everybody else's well-being, because it somehow feels that you have no access to feeling good unless everybody feels good too. I go in depth, and I talk a lot about this in my course with for healing codependence, for healing codependency, where I break down the entire mechanism, the entire unconscious journey to go there. And really this this journey of sort of healing codependency is a journey of finding yourself, right? But to find yourself, you really need to witness and to track it back to the beginning of how you became codependent, right? What pushed you? 
to become codependent. The making, right? You need to sort of catch it all the way back to the making. Another thing that is very common for codependents is to fall into the fantasy that love will save them, that life will be happy ever after if they're chosen, if they find their other half, they're not going to be alone. So they cling on and sacrifice a lot uh, for romantic relationships in their lives and to be chosen uh, by others. This is especially true for women because I work with mostly, not actually not even mostly women, but I work with a lot of women who struggle with codependency and this, this pattern of being chosen is really loud. And, you know, they would do that. And you're, a lot of people are even instructing this kind of thing. They become somebody others need, right? And they, they hook men in their lives or men hook women in their lives by being sort of always somebody you can rely on and they're going to help you and they're going to do things for you. Um, but is a way to kind of feel like you're securing somebody there by being somebody they have something to gain from, right? But it's not so genuine. Um, but no matter how much you give to someone, you cannot prevent anybody from leaving because that fear of abandonment that you have has this illusion that by abandoning yourself, others are not going to abandon you, but it's not true. It's not true and nothing can secure that. You enter this unconscious uh, sort of contracts with people that they don't even know about. And you're like, I'm going to give, I'm going to sacrifice myself, I'm going to do everything for you, and then you're going to do this for me. But the other people don't really, they don't even know about this agreement. But either way, even if they did, people fail to fulfill their agreements all the time or, or need to break out of them because we change, right? And if you think about the people that codependents choose are maybe people who are struggling with depression or with addiction or just miserable people or people who are not living in their potential. And so the codependent will show up, save their life, change the world. Um, but of course, when they get well, what's going to happen? They may not stick around. They may not stick around. You helping them and trying to save them and fix them is not going to be what's going to secure their love for you. And so at some point you'll understand that by abandoning yourself, you are not going to get what you thought you're going to get. Nothing secures that. Um, and it will show, it will really show when you stop giving, right? When you are spent on giving for everybody, when you tired of trying to fix, save, and you get nothing in return. And even if you weren't expecting anything in return, all of this giving creates imbalanced relationships, right? You enter the relationships already being such a overwhelmingly giving person. It's not a, tra a good trait, right? It's more like it's a trait of somebody who doesn't value themselves enough and just dedicates themselves to the other. And so the other's like, great, I'm the superstar here. I don't need to do much for you, right? So we're already setting up uh, ourselves for failure entering dynamics in that way. So I know all of this sounds harsh, but you know, sometimes we just have to listen to things that sound harsh. Uh, and maybe, maybe there's something we can do with what we're hearing besides just feeling attacked. Maybe there's some truth for us there, maybe not. And this is for you to decide. I know you always want to appear good and I know it feels like very self-defining because all of who you think you are is based off of how others are perceiving you. So of course, if you're perceived good, you're good. And if you're perceived bad, that's catastrophic. You have no inner reference to being good and you can't hold on to thinking I'm good even if they think I'm bad or whatever they're thinking because the you doesn't really hold so much value for you or credibility, right? You don't really engage with it enough. So I'm going to be offering some harsh truths um, for you to think about and then some things that you can do in order to begin to shift out of codependency. Let's start. Truth number one, people will leave regardless of how much you try and trap them into needing you. It doesn't matter how much of an easier life they'll have with you, Nothing can secure them staying forever. Not to mention, you end up pretty tired. Number two, nobody can save you from your life, no matter how much they try. And you know that this goes both ways because you've been trying to save a lot of people and you've saved a few or maybe you tried. But ultimately, you come to the same conclusion. People need to do it for themselves. So 
as much as there's no Prince Charming coming to save you from your life and giving you a happy ever after, and trust me, if there was a Prince Charming that would just take you to his castle, there's probably going to be a price if somebody just, you know, transports you to their life. You're going to have to be playing a role in that life, uh, ultimately, of someone who serves the other. Changing your life, saving your life, creating a, a better life, all of these things should be your own responsibility as an adult. Now, truth number two, how much you give to someone cannot ensure uh, that they will love you. Again, this unconscious exchange that you're betting on is not how things work. People who know how to love and give will, suit, will do so regardless of your self-abandoning devotion. And if anything, people who actually know how to love will not be encouraging you or allowing you or enabling you to abandon yourself. Even if it's in their benefit, people who want to love you are not going to want you to abandon yourself. They're going to want you to take care of yourself and they want to take care of you and they want to take care of themselves and they want everybody to be taken care of, but they know that each one assumes their own responsibility for taking care of themselves and their needs to an extent that needs to be done. Another truth is, you know, self-abandoning isn't a virtue. It's a sign of a non-existent worth. And there's no prize for being a martyr. There's no prize of being the most selfless person to have ever lived. Maybe there is, but you, actually you don't want that kind of prize. Because what does that even mean? The perception of others is actually saying, oh, look, you don't have a self and we're praising you for sacrificing the self that you don't have for others. You know? You're just diminishing yourself to nothingness, really, in this journey of a martyrdom that you chose. And another truth is that you are basking for a lot of recognition and, and sort of people confirming that you have worth while you're completely unaware of who you are and what you're worth. And it shows by the way in which you're behaving, right? You're behaving as somebody who doesn't have worth, but at the same time you're demanded to be recognized the worth you're not really showing up as having. It sounds a little bit confusing that we would do it this way, right? Because if we want others to recognize us, we have to be the first to actually do that for us, right? We're, the way we present ourselves, the, our expectations, the way we respect our time and our boundaries will set the tone of how we want to be treated, not our devotion and self-abandoning. Now, here's a few suggestions of what maybe you can do instead. Again, these are all my suggestions. Take what works or what resonates. Leave what doesn't. So the first thing that I work on with the people that I work on on one-on-one -on -one and everything that I teach is around the core is you need to get to know yourself. You need to create an actual relationship with who you are, spending time with yourself. And that can only happen through actually working through your history, finding out who you were, why you became the way you did, exploring big moments where you remain kind of stuck in time and also understanding this uh, journey that took you to codependency so that you can reverse engineer back to your authenticity. So you need to spend time with yourself. You need to journal. You need to go to therapy if you can afford to. You need to really know who you are. And all of the giving that you're giving to others, all of this selflessness, this anticipation of needs, making sure you're, they're content, you're really good at identifying what everybody needs. You're really good at knowing how they're feeling. You're really good at knowing how to help someone. So use all of those skills, but turn the attention to yourself instead. Because many people, when I work one-on-one -on -one with people who are codependent, they'll say, I don't know how to know myself. How do I get to know myself? How do... And they don't think they have the skills, but you're highly perceptive of everything around you. And you can also anticipate things because you've been studying people since forever. Now we just want to reverse the studying towards yourself, right? So this is, this is going to be a vital part for you. Uh, you know, finding out your needs, your values, your wants, what you want to do in your life, right? Finding a goal in life that doesn't revolve around being chosen, being loved, being recognized 
for your lovability uh, by a partner, but actually finding something that makes you passionate, right? Being in a place where you're with yourself and you're creating something. Um, and as I said, exploring your history with bravery and honesty, this is going to be also helping you become more mature and take on the responsibility of yourself with a lot more, with a lot more courage. On that also, I will want to add that you need to learn how to be alone without feeling like you're disappearing into nothingness. You exist even if nobody's there. And there's somebody there and you need to get to know her or him. You also may, may want to get to know my dog. Oh, that was oh, that was come here. Come here. Can you see the snout? Can you see this? the snout of this doggy? Yeah. This guy needs attention. Every five minutes, it's like a medication for him. Right, so as and as I said before, finding something you're passionate about, uh, pursuing fulfillment, self-actualizing, owning your own skills, the whole journey back to yourself will be, you know, you starting from the beginning of what happened to you, who you became, what shaped you, right? And exploring your biggest wounds and then becoming the parent that you needed, you know, to yourself and for yourself, maturing emotionally and not being uh, so hyper-focused on others, bringing the attention to yourself, getting to know that self, creating the boundaries, knowing the needs, having a vision for your life and moving towards actualizing that life, using your potentials, bringing your, your skills into the world, being passionate about something, becoming the person you needed to save you from your life, you're becoming that person. You're becoming that person you've dreamt of would come here and change your life. And that is that is the work I do, you know, and, and I've noticed with a lot of people that I work with that came to me because they were in relationships and the typical is women would come to me were very codependent in relationships with narcissistic men and stuff. And so we would start the work with detangling all that and, you know, it is... It is really important for me that we don't we don't focus on the narcissist, right? Or you know, we we're gonna cover all of that. But my biggest focus is always turning everything back to yourself, working on yourself, actualizing your real self, not this false self, to be the perfect this, the perfect like none of none of what you thought you were supposed to be doing in order to be loved and accepted, but more so what you want and what fulfills you. And that is such a journey to go from selfless to finding out you have a self and then actualizing that self. But before you were selfless, you had this fake self. You're trying to self-actualize a fake self, right? Become the better, the best partner, the, be the best mother, the best in the eyes of others, but not fulfilled in, in your own experience. So that kind of work is not easy but it's definitely doable and I've seen it happen with so many people. And it's so rewarding to see yourself go through this because it's something that you've done for yourself. And so you became the person actually, you're, you, you've been needing to have all your life. So I know how hard it is to do things you've never done and to be in a way you've never been before and finding out that who you are underneath all of the things that you became, right? When we take off that mask, we have to really start over. It's like, who are we? We're not inventing someone new. We're undoing and unbecoming who we became. And, you know, we were so prone to adapting. We're so quick to adapt to this that we missed out on getting to know who we are and finding out our, our own power. And as I said before, a lot of the people that I work with are women and they're especially prone to adapt this way and fall for the whole, let's find a prince and, and have this incredible life with, right? Just like you were this invisible, unrecognized Cinderella and the prince saw you and then your life magically changed. And I'm not saying we're not supposed to be pursuing relationships or that I don't want that for you, but because they are vital, both romantic and friendships and generally connection with everybody around us, but it's very important to also be able to connect with ourselves, right? Um, and it's pretty problematic that we've oriented our lives 
towards fantasies and immerse ourselves only in being from a relationship to a relationship to get some relief, right? Like it feels quite addictive to get that relief of being chosen, of, of reaching that milestone, to be that woman that we were told we have to be. Because we're sleeping on our own potential and distracted at the end of the day with being chosen, being seen, and to relieve this anxiety of the looking, the looking to be recognized um, as who we're, we thought we're supposed to be the perfect wife, the perfect mother, the perfect employee, the perfect anything. So my final sort of thing that I want to say to you is it's time to stop throwing away your life in this obsessive pursuit of worth because it's difficult to outsource it in the way you've been trying to do it, especially because it's been not authentic. And so even if you get glimpses of people acknowledging you, there's a part in you that will not uh, register that because you know it's not you. I used to see this client a long time ago, and I said to her, um, get your friends to write you letters about how they feel about you and bring them Bring them to, to session and I want to I want to have a look because I wanted to see how people perceive her. And they all said many loving things, but many of them said about the things that she does for them. And I didn't comment anything and I was just, you know, she was reading through and then she said, and I said to her, oh, they seem to really love you and, and recognize the things that you're doing. And she said, yeah, but would they love me if I wasn't doing all of that? And that's not to say that we don't do things for the people we love, but if that's our personality or the way we connect, the only way we connect is by being somebody uh, of service, but more of selfless service. Are we going to be seen for anything else? They don't see anything else. So what are they, what is their for them to love. So if you want to dedicate yourself to something, I strongly hope and suggest that you dedicate and you put this goal for this new year to work on your codependency and this attitude to self-abandon in the pursuit of worth and reorient all of your attention to yourself not because we want to become self-absorbed and nobody else exists. We're going to bring it. Self-actualization also includes this aspect of coming back into the world and serving the world, but not out of this pursuit of recognition and worth, but out of genuine open love, but as fulfilled and, and solid beings, right? We're not chasing our worth. We're generously giving but we also hold enough within to sustain ourselves. And then we're creating different relationships with not only ourselves, but the world. And it's really worth it. Finding yourself um, and recognizing who you are and who you became in order to survive are going to be changing your life. Like if you work on codependency and do this deep work of codependency, your life is not going to be the same. So, so that's it for today. I'll see you guys soon.